Okay, so the title of our talk, Next Generation Application Management, subtitle, System D for your win. And you might have seen similar talks presented at Academy and Guardec, but now we're presenting them together. So we're joined by me, David Emerson, from the KDE side, and Benjamin Berg. From the GNOME side, um, yeah. Yeah, so I work for Blue Systems, Ben's working for Red Hat. So opposing desktops, opposing colors, a possibility to have an EU flag in the background. We've got a lot of opposition, but we also have the same problems. So as a desktop, what we want to do is get a user able to control their system. It's our job as a desktop environment to put a user to your application so they can run your applications, use your applications, and most importantly, manage your applications. <coughs> So in terms of managing what's going on on your own system, it used to be a case several years ago, you'd have your browser, you'd have your instant messenger, and you'd run PS and you would see your browser and you would see your instant messenger. And that would be pretty straightforward. And when I started using Linux 10 years ago as an idiot, I could understand it. Now, the situation is very different. I run my browser, my instant messaging client, and this list is truncated because it doesn't all fit on one slide. It's ridiculous. And even as I've grown as a Linux user, I now no longer know what's going on on my own system. So my instant messaging client here, Discord, is 13 processes. And they all have ridiculous names that don't make any sense to anyone. Even if you had like a PhD, you still wouldn't know what any of this is. So, Understanding what's going on is difficult, just to see everything, but it also means that any aggregated resources are effectively meaningless. If I look at in our power top and see which process is draining the CPU, oh, it's not Chromium, it's a web renderer, like a sneaky disguise for, for Chromium, so we can't see what it is. And the problem is it does fool people, you, you can't be in control of your own system anymore, and these stats are effectively meaningless. The other problem we have, I mentioned previously, that instant messaging client was 13 different processes. Whereas Krita, just one process. So you've got this intense graphical application, and all the scheduler is going to see is 14 processes. So if it's 14 processes, the scheduler, trying to be fair, is going to give each of them as much resources as they ask for evenly. But evenly, without the context of any metadata, is in this case wrong. And there's also a situation of being fair between users, particularly if you're in an enterprise setting, kind of multi seat environment where you have one physical machine and there's several users attached. It doesn't make sense that one person's browser experience gets hampered because somebody else is running some intense MATLAB operation sucking all your CPU away. It should be fair that each user gets the same amount if they both try and request all of it. Or a similar situation, your desktop's locking up, you know something's going wrong, you SSH in to try and fix it, your SSH terminal is hanging because all your CPU is sucked up by a thing you're trying to fix. That's not, it's trying to, it's, there's no concept of fairness with a new session that started. It should have as much as resources as the session that's running if it tries to get them. And as well as being fair, it's difficult to try and discriminate things to be unfair, to go the other way. So currently, we've got background services hanging in the background, like the file indexes or backup solutions. And you can run nice, you can kind of suppress them down to an extent. But only if that application itself has really opted in to do it, or you go out and manually figure in all of the extra steps by hand, which doesn't really work. But it's impossible to elevate a process. And we generally, especially now with the compositors and Wayland, we want them to keep the desktop responsive. It's super important to keep your, your mouse moving smoothly and everything, even if something else is happening on your system. So we want to boost that. But because NICE is system-wide, you, you can only drop uh, niceness. You can't raise it without additional permissions. Um, because everything is relative to your whole system at once, and you need to have elevated permissions, which means it's not usable for us as a desktop. So we need a solution. 
And the solution is to use cgroups, which is the kernel level feature to group processes uh, together with systemd to configure all this stuff. So uh, cgroups allows us to hierarchically order processes and allows us to put them into groups, control groups, that's where the name comes from, cgroup. And uh, then we can all nicely hierarchy them and we know what's going on and we can actually figure out how, how to configure it and we can configure it. So we have lots of control controls available. Like the most important for us are CPU, IO and memory, but uh, you could also imagine like a graphics memory controller later on, which doesn't exist yet, which would be very interesting to have. Um, and then we have systemd, which hides the details and configures it for us. So if you look at like a hierarchy, this is the hierarchy from a running GNOME session, basically. Um, so what we have is that the system, on, on the system level, the things are uh, split up as like user slice, that's all the user processes in there, then user 1000 slice, that's my the process of my user, and user 1000 service is the actually systemd service that manages all my processes. And then underneath there, the session slice um, contains the important session processes and app slice will contain the applications. In this case, it's a terminal with a few sub processes and everything. So you notice, for example, that GNOME Shell Wayland service is actually GNOME Shell, it's X Wayland. And then it's also IBIS like input method stuff all grouped together in one group. Um, and then the C group controllers allows us to get more information and to, to set things up. So the CPU controller is uh, for CPU resources and it'll, for example, give you statistics for each C group. It'll uh, give you pressure information, pressure stall information. That means that a process is not actually doing anything because it's waiting for this resource to become available. So if you have 16 processes running and for cores only, then each one will only run 25% of the time at maximum, basically. And you'll see that here that the processes are waiting. And CPU wait allows you to configure the wait and prioritize parts of the process. Uh, the, the, these processes configured to other or there is CPU max, configuring maximum and a lot more things. If you want to know the details, you can look into the cgroup v2 documentation in the kernel. Um, another important controller is IO. Uh, same thing there, you get the statistics, you get the pressure, you get the weight. You also have like a latency flag, so the kernel tries to guarantee low latencies, but that's actually not non-trivial to use, unfortunately. Um, also, the I.O. controller, while really important to keep the desktop smooth, because quite often um, when the desktop is hanging, it's waiting on, on things to be loaded from disk. So, uh, it would be very useful to have the IO controller fully working. Unfortunately, as C groups are primarily developed for the uh, data center and on top of ButterFS right now, to, to actually use these features, you need to have a ButterFS right on a partition on your disk. You can't have like a lux volume in between or something like that. Um, but if this works, then you should get very good process separation, process isolation uh, between things. And then you have also the memory controller. Memory is slightly different to others because uh, you have one huge chunk of memory, but you can't fairly, like one process might use a lot, another process might use little, and things will change over time. So it's a different thing to, to distribute fairly. Um, but you also get all the same information, like the current memory consumption, the statistics, and the pressure information. How often are you waiting for memory? Uh, to be swapped in and dragged back from disk. The interesting part and something that I would like to point out is that memory.current, so the current memory consumption of a C group actually contains all the uh, caches. So file caches are part of what a process needs to run. So if you have like a process that, I don't know, reads a two gigabyte file at startup and then does nothing and just sits there, and no other process needs the memory, you will actually see memory current for this process to be above two gigabytes of memory because this memory is being used for the process right now. Even though it's not needed currently, it's still there sitting um, in case the process needs it again. Um, this is, I'm pointing this out primarily because people are getting confused because memory is not just the heap, the, the allocations that you do, but memory is everything from allocations to executables and libraries and also like 
shared stuff in between applications. And then some of it will be swapped out, some of it will, will be read back from disk when needed. Um, so I was going to like, show this a little bit, just with the CPU, uh, with the entire screen. No. What's going on now? This worked before. Ah, oh, there. Yeah. There we go. So what I have here is terminal tabs. So GNOME terminal is already smart enough to place each tab into, into a C group. So what I, I'm doing now is I'm running test, which is just stress ng burning CPU. Um, and oops, <laughs> apparently I had it already enabled. So if I do, don't, don't do anything, what you'll see is that I have one process running in, in one tab and two processes running in another tab. So this is tab one, uh, tab test one is the first tab, the dash two is the second. And you'll see that all of them get one third of a CPU core. They are all pinned to the same core, so it's 100% overall. Um, so even though they are in different C groups, they are still treated the same way between applications. And now if I enable the CPU controller, so I just, enable the CPU controller for the subtree of the terminal, what happens is that each tab will receive the same CPU amount. As one tab is running one process, this process will receive 50%, and as the other one is running two processes, it will, each one will get about 25%. And you can see this here very nicely. Test one is getting 50%, test two is getting 25% of CPU time. And then we could even, even go further. So if I look at the C group, um, C group, so I can, I can read the C group information for the, for the process, so I know in which, in which C group it is in, which is the scope. So now what I could do is I could even further uh, prefer the test one process, the C group in there. So what I do is I echo 500 to CPU weight. The default is 100, so this will now receive five times more CPU time than the test two processes together. And you'll see that now it's 80% for test one and around, like, yeah, 8.3%. Okay, this is top being weird. So you can see that we can change a lot of things and this way, uh, configure what's going on and actually distribute things in a more fairly manner. Okay, so another thing that I wanted to mention is that Facebook is doing a lot of development for their service on, on the C group stuff. And they have now released a um, demo, demo, demo tool like to test all the different features and everything and it'll make sure that your system is configured correctly uh, and to try it. Um, so as they are developing all the kernel features, they um, also test obviously that it's working well and then they use it to separate the different services running on, on the same server. Um, and this demo, like check out the demo if you're really interested. There's a lot of documentation there on how it all works and why it works. Um, so if you're interested, this is a great way to learn more about Cgrips and how they are working. Um, and then on the system D side, what we need is it, it'll manage the C groups for us and it'll set all the attributes up. So basically what we do is we simply use system D uh, and because it makes sense to do it the same way between cross desktop, we actually created a draft specification. Uh, it's still a draft. There is probably going to be a few changes, but the major things are scoped out. So. The idea is that we split the session into three parts, which is the session slice, the with all the very important processes that are critical for responsiveness and, and can't easily be restarted. App slice, which is the bucket where everything else will go in by default, and systemd actually just changed, so it will actually go in there by default. And then you have background slice, where we want all the tasks to go that we can slow down to like crawling halt if in case the rest of the system needs resources. And an important aspect here is that we're using systemd and what we are doing is 
encoding the application ID into the systemd unit name. So we can, from, from the process, grab wrap the C group name, and then from that, just extract the application ID. And know, you, we know which application as something is belonging to the process. So in terms of a current state and the rollout we have within the desktop, within GNOME, and within in Plasma, we're at a situation where every time you launch an application now, it gets put in its own C group. And that's something we've had in Plasma since 5.18. Uh, GNOME's had it for a while as well. And then the next step is surfacing this to your users. So right now we're attaching, putting things in C groups, your kernel can make use of this information, and that's already happening on your system right now if you're up to date, and you should always be up to date. Um, uh, but we're not really exposing everything that we can be exposing so far. So in terms of exposing this, one of these classic examples is system monitor. So in, in KDE Plasma, we had just a big list, and we could turn it into a tree view, but it was still just a tree view of processes, which loses a bit of information. And this is what we had before, and this is what we're going to see coming up in the future, where we see an application as one thing. We can see it aggregated resources, it aggregated memory and CPU and, and disk usage and memory as well. Um, but then we can drill down if we, if we find we want to further. So we took all this information, and we can present this in a way that's really easy to consume. Gnome tried then. Yeah, we tried. So GNOME actually had some heuristics, like looking at the binary name, figuring out, trying to figure out which application it belongs to and, and stuff like that. Uh, but that wasn't really quite working. If you look at this screenshot from before, which is like system, is like the catch-all where if it can't tell where it belongs to, it just drops it in there. You see 3.4 gigabytes. And then notice web, the, the GNOME web browser is using 560 megabytes here. Um, and then if we look at the next slide, uh, David? Thank you. Um, what you'll see is that suddenly system is only using the 1.8 gigabytes and web is using 2.1 gigabytes. These are the same processes. I just patched like the unpatched version and the non the, the patched version. And so suddenly GNOME is actually able to to act to better tell which memory what what process uh, what application is using the memory, and all it needs is looking at the PID, figuring out which C group it belongs to, and then extracting the name from that and using that instead. Yeah, so it generally it's much more reliable because it's sending all your data through your core and then we can read it from so, there. So we're now lying you to you differently, but the lies are better. <laughs> yeah. So the next part of this, as well as surfacing this in terms of viewing a stats, we can also control things. So one thing we want to land in Plasma, but it's a very universal idea that I'm sure we're going to see in GNOME very soon as well. It is concept of a foreground booster. So typically, if you are stressed for resources and your computer has to make a decision of what to prioritize, your best thing is to prioritize the active application because that's where the user's looking. That's where they're going to notice any slowdowns or glitches or anything. And it's clearly where they're trying to divert their attention. So it's become an incredibly tiny, simple task. Now we have the C groups. A tiny daemon, it's literally just 50 lines, just watching for what's active window. And when this happens, we just adjust your weights. And as I said, what we can do with C groups compared to what we could do with NICE is we can move things up as well as down. But that allows us to just boost things instead of just suppressing these background services. So we can do a similar thing on, on the system level for the users we already mentioned that we want to do uh, uh, disc uh, shared between users fairly and stuff like that. Um, so to, I looked into your resource D, which was also the idea of uh, keeping your desktop responsive. So the idea is that we, first of all, enable all the resource control features, because right now GNOME currently just uses the hierarchy, uses C groups, but doesn't actually enable all the features. Um, but then furthermore, it makes sense to prefer the currently active user who has a graphic, graphical session. So if you have a mouse moving around, it should be smooth all the time. Uh, and to that end, the idea is that we also give memory guarantees to this user and we boost the important session processes. So what you, you, you just by simply installing it 
effectively does is that all your applications are going to be treated as equals because it'll just enable the the C group controller by setting the appropriate systemd configuration option just using a drop in configuration. So if you have like a parallel compile job in one terminal window and then a single browser tab like the video call here, the video call will still get a lot of CPU time and can basically use a full uh, full CPU core for its purpose. And you also get like fork bomb protection effectively. And so, so what we do, what you research D does is a tiny daemon that sits in the background and all it does is look at who, which user is currently active on a graphical login and this user will then will then receive a share of of memory that is guaranteed for it so it can actually right now it's like 250 megabytes by default so 250 megabyte share of memory is passed to the user and this is then passed to the important session processes and so if an SSH user comes in and runs their simulation, obviously not using MATLAB, but using NumPy and SciPy, then it will not slow down the rest of the system uh, and the graphical user. Uh, so effectively, what we can achieve is there's some protection of the session from thrashing, because with due to memory guarantees, it will at least have some responsiveness left. Um, and this compositor receives also a greater CPU share and and this way all the important services or everything should stay reasonably responsive in most times. So it's a very simple piece of code really. It's, it's the most policy daemon and system the unit configurations. We have rolled it out in Fedora 33 by default now. So you get it there out of the box and elsewhere I'm not sure if anyone else has picked it up but you can also just check it out on GitLab, um, you research D if you look for it under my username. I'm going to be present here again. So what does this mean for you as an application developer? We're here at LAS. So most of you, hopefully, are application developers trying to make all applications work excellently on Linux. So we're here talking from a desktop point of view. and Generally, if you're an application developer, you don't need to do anything because it's an application, it's a desktop itself that when you open your, um, an application from the start menu or whatever your GNOME equivalent is, it has a job of putting it in a C group, adding your metadata, tagging everything. So you generally don't need to do anything. But there is a case where applications then launch other applications. So if you open a link in your own application, you're opening a link, um, or if you're creating your own file browser from scratch because you don't like the ones we provide, um, then obviously when you click on a file, it's going to open a whole new application. So from your point of view as an application developer, the important part is to use a relevant high-level API that we get from the from, from the stacks. So from KDE, that's open URL job or application launcher job, and this takes care of all of these details under the hood. For GNOME, that's G app info launch URIs or this other one, and that will take care of all of the details. If you're running inside a flat pack, you're going to need to use a relevant portal API anyway, because otherwise nothing's going to work. And if you use a relevant portal API, again, all of this will be taken care of under the hood and you won't need to worry about it. The dream. But you still have all of the options available, so we can capitalize on everything as a desktop, but you as a service can as well. Right, so um, let's just give a, give a few simple examples and, and some views. So usually right now, if you, if you have a service that starts at login, you might uh, ship an XDG out to start file, and that's actually still fine to do in general. But if you want to get more control over this, the way to go is to use dbus activation, probably. So the best way what you can do is you ship a dbus service instead, you activate that dbus service. And then dbus, uh, you can configure it to, to start a systemd service unit uh, in order to run the dbus service. So at that point, you have a systemd unit file that you can write and that you can provide. So you can simply dump in all the information and you can configure it as much as you like. 
uh, while getting all the different features that systemd has, that the resource configuration has, and improving your integration into the desktop. So this is like a very good way of, of being able to leverage the features, just run everything inside a systemd service uh, as much as possible. And then there you can set, the, for example, the systemd slice, the set custom resource limit, or also restrict access to system resources and other things. Like you could prevent your application from running fork, for example. So an, an simple example might be like a backup application which should run in the background. It should never slow down other applications that are running on the system. So you want to make the uh, the desktop aware of this background service running. So this is why we want to place it into background slice. Um, and you also want to make sure that it's not hitting the disk too much or preventing other applications from, from having the files in memory that they need. So the way to do is, as I said before, you just put create a debug service just only for the backup job itself. And you put it into, or you could also put it into transient scope, which is a different way which is probably more complicated to do, really. And then you configure this service by setting the slice to background slice. So we tell that it's running in the system uh, in the background. So the you know, the the shell knows what's going on, the desktop. And then what you would also do is set memory high to a relatively low value. And memory high, as I explained earlier, also contains file caches. So that means you effectively and cage the process to a pretty small amount of memory on the system, but you also make sure that all the file caches that anything else might need will remain cached and and all the other processes won't be inhibited. And another scenario would be the terminal application or also like a browser might be a similar kind of thing where you want each terminal window, each tap to be treated equally. And this is this is with the demonstration that I did where in GNOME Terminal, it's already possible to do by doing a very simple drop-in configuration. Uh, so so in, this, in that case, what you would do is you would spawn your sub-process and you would create a transient scope for on systemd. So you tell systemd, all right, this, this new process is actually its own group and you move it over. And then by doing this, uh, you can also configure it using a drop-in. So the user can say, tell systemd to configure it if they wanted to, just by using, by matching on the name, basically. So VTE GNOME Terminal calls it VTE-spawn-something, and then we can configure everything that starts with VTE-spawn-to dash uh, to change its attributes. So an example might be that you put it into slice app dash org my terminal. So app is the prefix. So we order it hierarchically underneath app.slice. This is how systemd does it. So the dash is actually like the hierarchy. So you get app and then app app.slice and then underneath app dot app dash org my terminal slice. So we have a hierarchy there and we are telling the desktop that this is actually belonging to the, my terminal. And then kill mode in this case would set process because if you close a tab, you could you have now have the choice. Do you want to kill all the processes that are inside the tab, or do you want to leave the processes running and just kill the main process that you initially started? And this is what we show you here is that we only kill the main process because people usually expect that, expect things like screen to keep continue running. And then if you just enable CPU weight and IO weight to 100, which is the default value you get the effect that I showed earlier that uh, the resources are distributed evenly between the tabs. So it's quite a lot of extra content. I can see already seeing the questions, people going, oh, what are the specific things I need to le learn? Um, obviously, it's quite a lot to say, but we can just give you links instead for uh, easy use. So it is a specification. It is a cross-desktop standard that we're working on because it is important that we all use the same naming scheme for our slices and our naming scheme for um, how we refer to different C groups, particularly if we're trying to retrieve information from that. So the upstream specification is still a draft, but it's mostly what you should be working against. I've also put a comprehensive list of code examples of how to use this application. I mentioned a high-level API earlier, which 
you're probably going to want to use anyway. But I've also put in low level examples that work with straight up C, straight up Glib, even just a bash version as well. Or basically how to approach this are all the different stack uh, layers of your stack and how you can put this. Obviously, this isn't the best place for it, just being on a random gist, but we need to come up with a way of coordinating our documentation. Also, as I mentioned, it's something we've both been doing on our different sides. Uh, ben did a talk at Guadec, I did a talk at Academy. Ben also did a talk at Linux Plumbers, talking to kernel people about how we're actually using the features they did. Um, so if you want to see the same talk again, but with more of a twist towards the specific part, um, there's some relevant links here. So thanks for listening. If anyone's got any questions, and I can see what people do, um, we're happy yeah. to go through them. So the first question is, if an application starts another application, it should have its own slice property. I guess this needs additional work by the first application. So yes, this was what we were um, going into earlier. You, in the usual case, you just use the high-level APIs, and the desktop will do the same, the right thing for you. With, with glib and GNOME right now, the patches are currently still pending review, but um, it's going to happen. So if you use the high-level application, uh, APIs to launch application or to launch URLs, the right thing will happen. If you spawn, like use the low-level APIs to, to launch something, uh, a larger process that you want to encapsulate, then you'll need to do extra work and you'll need to do some stuff yourself. But like one of the tricks that to work around this is you use DBS activation for this part. Um, so that's a good way of avoiding having to deal with uh, the low-level stuff. And the second question, what do we need to take into account as application developers? Basically, the same thing again. It's You want to be using a high-level APIs anyway because there's important details like startup IDs for window management purposes that it's best to use regardless. Um, is there a timeline for this being enabled in GNOME and KDE? As I mentioned before, in terms of actually applying the C groups, we both have this enabled already. And it's, from our side on the KDE side, it's just the idea of do a silent rollout that won't break anything. It just tags things, and we've left it all your weight the same. So it'll be some subtle uh, changes to resource management at a kernel level, but it's nothing that should break a user experience. And it will just sort of slowly keep adding in different parts on top as we can make more reliance on fixing these tiny edge cases from these, from the fact that um, not everything is being spawned correctly with the part above. So Exactly. So, like for example, in GNOME right now, uh, the file browser because the glib APIs aren't merged yet, the file browser will actually not. If you if you launch a, like a PDF viewer in uh, using Nautilus in GNOME, then it will be accounted to Nautilus right now. Um, so these kind of things kind of uh, makes it not suboptimal to enable all the features right now. We actually some sometimes it's enabled like on Fedora 33, it will be enabled. Um, for GNOME, for KDE, not yet because the system D work hasn't been there is not there yet in in Fedora, uh, but in, on other distributions it will not be enabled. And also, there is a lot of ongoing development with regard to OOM killing and other parts of the resource control problem. So you'll see a lot of changes coming up uh, in the next one or two years, I would say. Yeah, but I, I, don't, I don't think it's going to be a definitive it's on or it's off. It will be this gradual, oh, we're going to rely on this for this feature, or it's going to be a fallback heuristic for this, or it's going to be used here. And we'll just see these tiny little parts come over time. Um, there might also be changes for, for application developers with like system DOMD where you can say then say, uh, if my application is waiting a lot for I.O., please kill it. Um, yeah. In terms of phone devices, the resources are even more strained there, so this absolutely applies. Basically, it's almost more important. Another thing that C groups provide, uh, which we've not mentioned yet, is, this, is another controller called the Freezer Controller, um, which allows you to just stop an entire application to, at once. And compared with Six Stop, it, work, it fixes a couple of bugs that um, you just can't. The yeah, application is, un is unable to prevent being frozen. The yeah, control group can just freeze it. So it's not something we can use right now, but it's something that in the future could be really, really cool and really useful for, for your phone. Yeah, or like 
completely suspending backup tasks while background tasks while a game is running or something like that, which also makes sense. Um, as for your comment about existing launches, as a general point, yes, existing launches will need to be changed. On a specific point of Steam, um, we've been speaking to Steam people. Um, I can say that they were one of the people that pushed towards this because having a high frame rate of a focused application, if that's a game, it's something they care about. And it, it, they've actually reached out um, ahead of time to say this is a goal that we want. And it's something that they're going to be adding at all completely. And in terms of how can we help make this possible, uh, one of the important points is if you run systemd cgls, which is equivalent like of PS, but shows a high hierarchy. Uh, thank you, whoever put that in your notes. Um, and you can see a slices, and you can see the hierarchy building up. And just run that, look for anything that seems out of place, and report it, fix it. Yeah, that, that would be a good thing. Um, then the other thing is uh, that, for example, systemd is getting systemd OMD right now. And the idea generally would be that rather than uh, that we start using that to kill processes, so the kernel OAM killer will only kill processes when the system is already frozen, basically. And then in Fedora, we are using early OAM now, which kills processes when, let's say, when there is not enough memory available for caches anymore. Uh, but the general idea would be that with systemd OMD, what we do is we kill processes when we actually are hitting the disk too much and the system is grinding to a halt. So if some people are interested, it would be really cool if they could grab the latest systemd, which contains systemd OMD, and start playing with the different settings and start coming up with scenarios on how to test whether the desktop is remaining responsive um, under load. And one other thing, if you really want to help, uh, one part we've got in Plasma at the moment is using systemd to manage all of our background and whatnot, which is somewhat separate from the concept of managing applications. And right now, this is off by default on Plasma, but hidden behind a config option that we can turn on. And I have a blog post that says where that config option is. If you Google for it, I'm sure it will come up. Or just reach out and ping me if you want to enable it and have any questions. I think we're probably out of time. Yeah. yeah. Um, actually, we technically have five more minutes. If oh. there are more questions, yeah. please yeah. We answer them. No, I, I, I'm not in a rush anywhere. Yeah, that's fine. The one's coming in right now. OK, Ben, you should read it out in real time as it comes in. You mentioned the debug starting for getting into management. Is that only required when you? OK, is that only required when you provide arguments or also for background processes? that use config files. Um, not sure what config files means here. Uh, so I assume if you have your own specific. Uh, so, oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah, you finished. OK. So um, in by default, Dbus will already start each application. If you use Dbus activation or something like that, then it will. Uh, will start everything in a C group already. So, it's, so you get all the features or um, arguments. It, I'm not quite sure what. <laughs> it, it makes sense when uh, you actually have something that should be an entity of its own. And, and starting using Dbus is just one method of placing the process into a, its own C group and also being able to ship a system deconfiguration files uh, so that you can configure it more. So you get both out of this, right? At the first step, if you just use dbus activation, it's one method of starting a process. Yeah, so it will end up in a system D unit. And then as the second step, you can provide a system D, your own system D service file to provide your own configuration options. I've placed that. Um pace bin of all the different implementations and all the different ways you can launch C groups um, into your shared notes chats because it's easy to click on um, a presentation. And that mentions Dbus, but also mentions all the other different possible ways we can you can spawn things in uh, 
mennyiségű, vagy 